Hello and welcome to India's World. After nearly eight years, Nepal has entered the final phase of constitution drafting. In June this year, four major political parties of Nepal reached a 16-point agreement to facilitate the stalled constitution-making process. They were spurred on by the need to rebuild the country after the huge earthquake of April 25th. However, the agreement left the borders of the proposed provinces of a federal Nepal undefined. Then suddenly in early August, the four parties agreed on six proposed provinces which would run north to south, connecting hills to the plains with each province bordering India. The ostensible goal was to keep each state economically viable. This was later on changed to a proposal to have seven provinces because of protests by some communities. However, even then the situation turned violent. The leaders of the Madeshi community in the southern plains and the indigenous Tharu community in the far western plains objected to the redrawn boundaries. They did not want to be clubbed with the hill districts dominated by the hill political elite. Up to now, 14 people have been killed in the protests that followed. Most of these deaths have taken place in the western Nepal district of Kailali. The Tarai plains bordering India have been paralyzed by a strike for over two weeks. Curfew has been imposed and clashes are frequent. To discuss the violence over state formation and constitution writing in Nepal, we have with us three distinguished experts on the country. We have with us Ambassador Jayant Prasad. He's been India's ambassador to Algeria, Afghanistan and Nepal. He knows the constitution making process very well. He was there at that time. Professor S.D. Muni, Professor Emeritus at the School of International Studies in Jawaharlal University. He's taught in Singapore National University. He's a specialist on Nepal and South Asia. He was also India's ambassador to Laos. And we have with us my old friend Tapan Bose. He's Secretary General of South Asia Forum for Human Rights. This organization was still recently based in Kathmandu. He's lived in Nepal for several years. He's also an author of a book on Nepal's Tarai. So I welcome you gentlemen to this discussion. Ambassador Prasad, let me begin with you. Do you think that the process of demarcation of provinces is not an easy issue in Nepal because it is at the core of the political battle for creating a federal Nepal? Federalism itself poses problems in Nepal because uh, they are unfamiliar with the idea. <clears throat> this is a subaltern idea. And Nepal's political makeup is backed up by a demographics which is very different from India. The hill Brahmins and Chhetris in Nepal alone constitute 31% of their population. The rest being made up by Madesis, those who live in the Tarai. Uh, not all the people who live in the Tarai are designated as Madesis, but the most uh, numerous are the mid-hill uh, inhabitants who are called the Janjatis. And uh, the problem is one of political distribution and patronage and authority. Uh, who runs the country. And uh, the subaltern demand uh, was uh, given a voice during the Maoist uh, movement, mm -hmm. which started in 1996 and resulted in uh, the 2006 uh, Accord, the Comprehensive Peace Agreement. And then the agreement between the Madesi groups and the Democratic parties of 2007, when it was decided that Nepal will be a federal country. This is the context in which the movement for federalism uh, came about. And it is different from India's experience because when India became free, it was used to the idea of federal units. And the Indian um, constitution, even so, did not have the words federation or federalism or, or federalism in, in, in it. Uh, so for uh, the Nepalese political elite to adjust to the idea has been difficult. Okay. Uh, Professor Muni, would you agree that the unitary system of governance that Nepal uh, followed um, it resulted in political power being captured by the, the hill elite, the Brahmins and the Chetris, or Bahun Chetris as they are called, uh, and that the political change that took place in 1951, 1960, 1990, and even in 2008 did not uh, address the issue of this imbalance in power sharing? This is absolutely correct because... You know, the question of alienation, particularly of Janjatis and Madesh, goes much before 1950. And, and you, even during the Rana regime, even when uh, Prathvi Narayan Shah came, uh, some of the Janjatis were not very happy where uh, they were, uh, you know, a Gorkha uh, kingdom was established. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, more than that, uh, Bharat, the idea of federalism is not, India confined. I mean, Jayant oh, has referred to absolutely. India. Different but, countries have had but different experiences. It's a universal uh, concept. And the concept's uh, spirit lies 
in accommodating diversity, particularly at a, a, in a context where diversity, a, a large majority, I mean, Jayanti is absolutely correct saying 31% are the dominant classes. The 60% per, and more uh, are feeling neglected. If they are feeling neglected, what is the formula which you find to accommodate them and identify them, give them an ownership? Now, this uh, revolution which took, or the change which took place, Jan uh, Andolan, very clearly underlined that the neglected classes will have to be brought on the board. Now, in order to bring on the board, one formula which is uh, universally accepted is federalism. And it is this issue which I think many of those leaders, you know, uh, the references to uh, accepting some of the Janjati and Madesh demands by GP Koirala, which unfortunately GP successors are not honoring. Yeah. Because, you know, this is a typical problem. It is not the caste-based problem. I think it is a problem of the Nepali leadership's vision and understanding of the whole concept. Okay. So, but do you think that uh, this, uh, federalism is a solution to uh, empowerment in a multi-ethnic, multi-religious society, irrespective of the size of that country? I mean, a country like, we've seen this kind of problem in Sri Lanka, now we are seeing a problem in Nepal. So, is federalism a solution irrespective of the size of the country? The, 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 it is certainly, it has to be, because Nepal has... Uh, been ruled for all these 250 years essentially by one formula and that is the the right to rule of the community that conquered and unified Nepal. This is the official history of Nepal which has put the Janajatis, which has put the Madhesis and everybody into a second class citizenship situation. Until about the 50s, the, even the Madhesis had to take a passport to go to Kathmandu, you see, and citizenship has remained a very controlled which has been used to give yeah. them, you know, not, not allow them to get land ownership and so on and so forth. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an extremely, you know, oppressive, exploitative way in which the, the people, I mean, the, so th there has to be a way out. There has to be an empowerment of these people. The promise of 1950 did not fructify. In 1990, when the Janajatis and others massively participated and for the first time in Nepali, in Nepal, the multi-ethnicity and diversity was actually ever recognized, you know, yeah. it entered the constitution. But even then, there, the promises made to them. But now that the, 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 uh, some provinces have been demarcated, why are the Tharus and the Madhesis getting upset? Why do, you, why do they think this will lead to an erosion of their rights? You see, the, the, the whole point is empowerment, as I'm saying. Now, if for 250 years you have been controlled, you have actually been, you know, treated as a second-class citizen by a powerful combine of what you call bound chhatri, which is known as the khas people who claim historically they are the people who came with Prithi Narayan Shah and they conquered and they made all the sacrifices and therefore they have the right to rule. And then if you, you know, you go to the Rana and the Mulki Ayan and all, you institutionalize their control. No, what, what is the fight about? We don't want them to continue to be the rulers. Okay. So if you look at the way the provinces have been carved out, in each province, there will be a substantial element of Mount Chhatri. So whether I'm a Janajati or I'm a Madesi, in any of these provinces, demographically or politically, if you look at it, the way they have been okay. made, I will always remain in secondary position. All right. All so right. why these provinces are not acceptable to us? Okay. We need to take a break at this point. We'll be back again with this interesting discussion in a bit. Stay with us. Welcome back. We're discussing the disturbances in Nepal over redrawing or drawing of provincial boundaries. Uh, Professor Muni, you wanted to say something about federalism before we went on the break. See, federalism is not a panacea of all the diversity. That is true. But in case of Nepal, nothing else was tried. There was no intent on the part of the central rulers to give them a feeling that, look, we want to uh, include them in, in, in the system. Therefore, why not try federalism? Okay. If you mess it up, yes, it can uh, create problems as well. Okay. Uh, Jayant, when it was evident that the Madhesi parties for long have had fought for a unified uh, 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 Madhesi province based on ethnicity uh, and you know, cult uh, cultural links, why was integration with the hill districts imposed on them? For the reasons that Tapan very nicely explained to you a minute ago, 
that uh, it was a question of uh, political domination. So the new districts that are being proposed to be carved, the six districts, uh, six province solution, the seven province solution, both of them are acts of gerrymandering. No, no, my problem, my, my question really was that yeah. you knew that this would not be acceptable to people of Madhis. No, they want to... Because they for, for they... long fought for uh, right. a unified Madhis. Ek Madhis, Ek Pradesh was the slogan. They then they were willing to settle for two. But then you mess it up deliberately and think uh, and you expect that there will be no protests. This was because the ruling elite found an opportunity. Uh, the Madhesis were very well represented in the preceding cabinets uh, during the first uh, constituent assembly. But they did not use that opportunity to force their political partners to arrive at a settlement when uh, the time was better for them to have struck such a deal. Now, in the second constituent assembly, they have been cut to size. Their allies have been cut to size, mainly the Communist Party of Nepal, Maoist. And they, uh, CPNM, have allied itself to the ruling combine of Congress and UML to propose this uh, seven province solution. So now the problem of the Madhesi population is that there is a disjunction between them and the political elite in Kathmandu, but there is also a disjunction between them and their political leadership, okay. of which the political elite in Kathmandu is taking full advantage. So, so Professor Muni, what uh, uh, Jain seems to be suggesting is that this, this junction between Madhesis and their political leadership, in this case, Vijay Gachadar, uh, is that uh, the, the uh, Bhavan Chetri elite has bought over uh, and subverted the leadership of the Madhesis. Because otherwise, what explains the fact that except for eight districts between Saptari and Parsa, all the 14 districts in Madhesis have been merged with hill districts. No, no. They are, my, my explanation is, I want to uh, add to what uh, Jayanth has said. Uh, besides their lesser numbers and power in the constituent assembly, there is a perception amongst the Pahadi leadership that Madesh and Janjatis are internally divided. There is no proper leadership to assert themselves. Now, what they are missing out is that at least in the course of last seven years, particularly when this Madesh revolt was there against the Maoists, they have, the, what they are forgetting is that this consciousness has seeped down to the grassroots level. Therefore, what you see today, uh, um, um, Bharat in, in Nepal, is that the leadership is helpless, but people are rising. And therefore, you have disturbances all around. Yeah. There they may, they may not be extensive violence, but there is an extensive resentment to whatever the central leadership in Kathmandu is actually doing. Okay. Uh, let's talk about the Tharus, uh, uh, Tapan. The decision to include the Tharu-dominated uh, districts of Kelali and Kanchanpur in so-called Province 7, which is west of uh, Karnali River, has upset the Tharu community. Now, if you can create seven provinces, why not create uh, eighth one as the Tharus are demanding? You call it Tharuhat uh, and put all the... Uh, 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 Tharu areas together, or does it put paid to the plans then of hill domination? They can do nine, they can do ten, provided it, the question is, do they want to do it? And the answer to your question is what you said, that they don't want to lose the control. Uh, and this is, you see, historically, if you look at it, Tharus are the ones who lost the most in terms of, you know, their control over land. And th they were the first to lose land. During Mahendra's time, when the second unification, as they call it, uh, he, he started the program of sending hill people down and settling in, uh, in Tarai. And Tharus were the first to lose their land, because it is the hill people who came and first settled on Tharu land, uh, and so on and so forth. Second thing is, see, there is also a problem. The problem is, when one Madhis, one Pradesh began, Tharus and Madhesis were together. The, you know, there was a lot of effort made to break the Tharu and Madhesi unity, as uh, Jayanji pointed out. And that is how the whole Tharu, uh, Tharu, you know, Lakshman Tharu and others who led it, and, you know, there was whole, also the split. So Tharu heart demand came, and they said, we don't want to be part of Madhesi. In between, we also forget there is a Muslim community uh, who are neither happy with the Jadav and Hindu-dominated uh, Madhesi movement, uh, nor with the hills, they in fact, at one point of time, we did a survey in, in, in Tarai in 2008. Uh, we found that they are moving more and more towards the Tharus. So there is, a, there is an issue for 
the 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 hill elite uh, they they don't want any kind of you know this sort of an unity and political formation to come together there is also another thing you see the point is the hill are so hill people are so paranoid they want to have independent access to india border uh, avoiding any possibility of any blockage hmm? so <laughs> so if you look at the but six how many seven, entries do you need you don't need seven entries to india uh, they, they know, have already states. created sir they they've already created six and some of them are ridiculous like the one between you know madhesh and uh, between the third and the fourth province just a narrow strip they're taking it down so this is so i mean you understand the mindset if my mindset okay. is thus and i cannot trust and and there is the major problem is they cannot trust the madhesis they think the madhesis will take this area to india and it's part of the old mithila raj which the british gave them well india may not want that but well, that's the point but don't forget <laughs> mithili is the second largest language of nepal yeah but you know tamil was a common language we didn't want the ltt and the tamil no, areas of sri lanka we don't want the naga areas of myanmar it's not but, a question but of india we'll leave, wanting it not that. wanting but this is what has been one of the major factors in nepali hill elites politics okay. distrust of them thinking that these will so this goes back to the british period okay no, but let me just ask you a quick question before we end this segment what would happen if the new constitution is not owned up by the country's minorities would constitution writing and this business of federalism not become a self defeating exercise because it was meant to address the issue of the minorities absolutely. and then you fail in doing that absolutely and if you take a lesson from india the simple one word answer to your question is yes you are right in your presumption that constitution will have no meaning and to fear that a federal constitution a genuinely federal constitution will would lead to the uh, creation of century uh, petal Uh, influences would lead to the break up of the country precisely the contrary would happen yes. because federalism in india whatever however it has evolved has led to the unification of india absolutely that's very well put we need to take a break again at this point we'll be back again in a bit stay with us welcome back we're discussing the disturbances in nepal over drawing of state boundaries Uh, Professor Muni, uh, do you agree with the charge of the Madhesi, Tharu, and indigenous Constituent Assembly members of Nepali Congress that the political parties have dealt with this business of drawing of uh, state boundaries in a in a peremptory manner, in an oligarchic manner, without consulting all the uh, stakeholders? And it is this that has led to the violence after the demarcation of state boundaries. Absolutely. Even uh, Prime Minister Modi, while talking to a nepali prime minister said that look 10 15 people sitting in a room cannot make a constitution what has happened are two basic flaws one flaw is that commitment made have been gone back on and that is where tharu and madhesh issue is absolutely critical because as i said girija babu had agreed into some understanding with the madhesh and tharus which was not carried out and secondly when you took vijay gachdhar on board obviously there was an understanding this his sensitivities would be accommodated and when they made the seventh promise uh, a province you know it is very interesting that gachdhar had not left the uh, four party coalition until the issue the, of the seventh province came and seventh promise was, uh, province was a literal uh, crafting on pure personal individual constituency level whether my a particular leader's constituency is affected or not affected now if this is what this is literally gerrymandering or or actually uh, doing things in a purely personal manner if you do that how will the communities not feel offended okay. it's as simple as that okay so but do you think that a different and a more consensual process uh, could have been used and should still be used to demarcate uh, uh, the boundaries of new provinces or do you think that okay you've had seven uh do some tinkering and this process of tinkering can continue but the constitution should be adopted no the, you see the the thinking or the mindset behind the, the the way these have been carved out goes back to you can link it to mahindra's five development zones of nepal mm. uh, this is this is looking at nepal in a way that the control will always remain in the hands of the the elite which belong the caste you know people what they call the bound chatri and this will not work 
and if you if you if you look at it, I think the only serious, sincere attempt was made towards the end of the first Constituent Assembly when they created the commission with uh, uh, I think Krishna Hachetu, Professor Krishna Hachetu as the chair, and it is a very well balanced commission. And they had come up with eight provinces, and I think four or six. Uh, autonomous uh, zones and that was based on the principle of recognizing the the communities their demands and also taking into account the economic and you know social and other cultural issues now that's that was rejected and if i am not wrong i think it was rejected essentially because of the opposition of the nepali congress and the cpn uml which is dominated by the bound okay. And so, see, the politically, if you look at it, mapping, it has been clear that any attempt by the Janajatis and by the Madhesis to get empowerment, to have control over their own resources and their, and, and their political destiny, has always been sabotaged. Fair enough. I only want to say this, that when you say Bhavan Chetris are khas people, what you mean is khas, which is khas Brahmins and khas Chetris, no. which is an anthropological and ethnographic term, not khas as special. Yeah. No, yeah. it's yeah. not Khas it? as special, yeah. it is Khas. Khas. This, yeah. this is a okay. community, I think, that comes from... No, no they, because Khas know. Brahmins and Khas yes. Chetris are also in our hilarious. But no, 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 no. leave, leave yeah. that aside. Correct. Uh, what I want to ask you is this, that up to now we've been uh, suggesting that only the Bahun Chetris, to retain their control, wanted the uh, states carved out in a particular manner, north-south states. Right. But there are people in Nepal who say that this has also been done under foreign pressure. And if I understand it correctly, they mean Chinese pressure, not Indian pressure. Because China does, did not want, apparently, some uh, ethnic states being carved out along its Tibet border because it feared that if such a thing happens, then the Tibetan uh, uh, rebels would find safe havens there. Is that correct? No, the Chinese were very reticent about this whole idea of federalism in Nepal because the Chinese foremost objective in Nepal is to look after their Tibetan problem, also the refugee problem. And what happens is that if a Tibetan asylum seeker reaches Kathmandu, gets into contact with human rights organizations, registers with the UNHCR, he gets a piece of paper which establishes his rights. But before he gets there, if he is nabbed by the Nepalese uh, police or any other authority, he is handed to the Chinese and the person is repatriated. The problem with federalism is that law and order would become a state subject and therefore the Chinese would have to deal with separate state administrations, which would become rather inconvenient for them. And this uh, easy mechanism that they have of controlling or stemming the flow of Tibetan asylum seekers or persecuted people into Nepal, that would come to but a complete stop. how does North stop. South uh, problem North help South them? does not really uh, help them, other than uh, they would be very supportive to the present ruling regime in doing what they want. The prop, But okay. that doesn't resolve the problem for the people who have a sense of Grievance oh, of being kept out. Absolutely. And, and so that but it doesn't serve Chinese interests either, only in a limited way. Very limited Because way. the bound Chetris would, as they have been doing in the past, the regime arrests people and sends them back to be, to so be that would persecuted not and prosecuted. So in, the in Chinese Tibet. fear is exaggerated. Okay. Yeah. Last question, we are running out of time. So, uh, Professor Muni, if Nepal has to protect the sanctity and the integrity of the constitution writing process, they've reached this point with great amount of difficulty with far too many sacrifices. What is it that Nepal needs to do? Still, there is time for the leadership to be resilient towards this question of identity and the special interests which are there. Flexible. I, 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 yeah, resilient, flexible, yeah. in order to accommodate them. Uh, I want to add uh, just one point. They should look at the whole question in the international context. Today, everybody is recognizing identity and trying to accommodate identity all over the world. Why it is that the Nepalese uh, leadership is so indifferent, yeah. if not hostile, to the whole question of identity, okay. which is uh, really creating the problem? Okay, quickly. Just to say that the differences actually are very small. Uh, even under the previous Constituent Assembly, Nepal came very close to settling this problem. Uh, I think the whole topography of province number seven should be changed and restored to what was proposed at that time what was under discussion, and there was a kind of very close to an agreement reached on 13th of May uh, 2011. And that whole thing broke down, sorry, 2010. 
and uh, that uh, 2011, sorry, 11. just before the Constituent Assembly gave 11 over. 11 provinces. 11 provinces idea. Now, the problem is only of three districts completely in the east, which is Jhapa, Surang, uh, Jhapa Murang, and Sunsari, and two districts in the Kailali west, which Kanchipur. is Kailali yeah. Kanchitpur. And that also is restricted to a few districts of these proposed provinces. If that adjustment can be made, then the constitution okay. can be written. Tapan, quickly, what should Nepal do? Well, I think, you know, <clears throat> they, they, as uh, Jan was saying, they need to go back a little into and, and bring back. It's all there. You know, I mean, the constituent, uh, the, the committee, the 11, first they came with 13 and they came down. That report in itself is perhaps gives the best possible way of resolving okay. the, the whole situation. Okay, okay. Also, the second thing is which they don't do. See, they always decide in a closed door meeting in a hotel where all the four parties go and keep all the members of the constituent assembly you know, out of any discussion. So they have to be more conservative. They need to, they need to be okay. more democratic within the CA. All right. We have run out of time, Tapan. So I'll have to cut you short. So I'd like to thank all of you, Tapan Bose, Professor S.D. Muni, Ambassador Jain Prasad, for participating in this interesting discussion. That is all we have for you today. We'll be back again next week as usual. Till then, goodbye. And thanks for watching India's World.